How can Allah be the most gracious, most merciful, most compassionate one? How can he be that and be just, be righteous as well? If we are to be judged according to our works, how is it that Allah can also have mercy or compassion on us? If he's just, the Christian God can do this because God punishes the sins of his people. He brings about justice through the death of his son Jesus who carries those sins upon himself on the cruel cross, the scandalous cross. Welcome to Christ or Chaos, a ministry of Village Church in association with the Converge podcast. I'm Chris Bolt, and today we're continuing our series addressing Muslim myths about Jesus. Now, if you missed our part one of this series, it won't necessarily matter, but I'd encourage you to go back and check it out. This episode is part two. If you go back to part one, we are addressing a pamphlet called Jesus, a Prophet of God, Learn the Basics, Gain Peace Through Islam. This is essentially an Islamic tract trying to convince you of Islam by, frankly, attacking one of the things that is at the core of Christian doctrine, namely the the beliefs that we have about Jesus Christ. So last time we looked at Jesus as God. This time we're looking at their titles, Son of God, Father and Lord, and Jesus the Prophet. And I'm going to rely fairly heavily here in this episode upon theological categories, systematic theology. Um, Unfortunately, this is a discipline that a lot of even Christians haven't really considered or thought through a great deal, and so certainly Muslims often come to these topics not really knowing what Christians believe systematically, or they conflate these claims with things that are in their own system of thought in Islam. So I want to quote from the pamphlet here under Son of God. They write, some Christians claim that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, I want to correct that right off the bat. It's not that some Christians claim that Jesus is the Son of God. All Christians claim that Jesus is the Son of God, or they are not Christian. That is one of the things that it means to be a Christian, is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They go on to ask the question, what does this actually mean? Surely God is far removed from having a physical and literal son. Now, I want to make the case that we can argue that there is a second person of the triune God, the eternal word, the Son of God, who never began to exist and yet is still called the Son. And if you want to call that literal, then fine. But I think it's probably dangerous to use language like physical and literal when we're talking about the triune God of Scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You notice, by the way, that our Christology, our understanding of the second person of the Trinity, influences and affects what happens with our doctrine of the Trinity. So, real quick, the doctrine of the Trinity is simply that God exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each of these is fully or truly God, and yet there is one God. And so they, again, are asking about the physical and literal aspects of being the Son of God. Well, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is not physical until he adds to himself, takes onto himself a physical nature, namely the human creaturely nature that he does in the Incarnation. And so we're going to talk about Jesus as the Son of God even prior to Jesus, the Son of God, taking on the human flesh to himself and thus being a physical son. Well, humans have human children, they say. Cats have kittens. What does it mean for God to have a child? Well, I want to answer that question in terms of the illustration they just gave there. Humans have human children because things tend to have the something of the same nature as themselves. In other words, the reason that a human has a human child is because he or she is human, right? I'm not saying that men can have babies there, but what I am saying is that we give way to creatures of our own nature. So also with cats. So humans don't have cats in that way, and cats don't have humans in that way, okay, there's always a, a, an owner and pet relation there, not a, a father and son relation there with a human dad and a cat 
okay, a cat son, something like that. No, a, a human dad would have a human son, and a, a cat uh, dad would have a cat son or a kitten son. Why? Because they are the same nature as themselves. Now, if we talk about that or apply that to the doctrine of the Trinity, what are we saying with the language of Son of God? What we are saying is that the Son is, at, is of the very same nature as the Father. Namely, the Son is God, just as the Father is is God. And so everything that can be said of the Father as God can be said of the Son as God. And so I'm going to come in a moment to more of their language and understanding of what the Bible means when it discusses Jesus as the Son of God, but I want to talk about the Son of God in those intertrinitarian relations before we ever even go on to or move on to the doctrine of the incarnation when the Son of God takes on human flesh. And so I stated the doctrine of the Trinity a moment ago. We don't believe that there was ever a time when the Son of God did not exist. The Son of God is eternal. He never began to exist and he never will cease to exist. Nor is there any time at which the Son of God became the Son. Rather, the Son of God is eternally begotten of God the Father. Now, there are theologians who will say that the Son, in some sense, has this derivative essence from the Father. I reject that and would accept what John Calvin, for example, set forth. The sonship of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, just is in terms of his relation to the Father. In other words, we cannot reverse those. You cannot reverse Father and Son in the Trinity. There is Father, there is Son, and there is Spirit. Each of these three persons subsists in the one divine essence of God without remainder. However, each of these three persons is distinct from one another in terms of person. The Father is paternal and has paternal relations toward the Son, who has those filial relations, who then there are relations with the Spirit, which are spiration, and the Spirit is also eternally spirated from Father and Son. And so that just is what we are meaning in terms of these persons. We're using what is called analogical language. We don't understand the Son of God to be a Son in every single identical way that we understand sons to be sons in the realm of human beings. Why? Because human sons begin to exist at some point. They are caused to come about not merely in terms of their person, but also in terms of their being. When it comes to the second person of the triune God, the Son of God, the Son of God never begins to exist in terms of his essence or being or existence. Rather, he is eternally begotten in terms of his person. He's eternally begotten of the Father in terms of his person. That is why he is the Son and never the Father or the Spirit. And so it's not as though he begins to exist either as Son. He again is eternally begotten as the person of the Son. And that's why this is only an analogical description of what's going on in the Trinity. That's why we can look at humanity or even cats and see how this process works. That is an analog or an analogy or an illustration or reflection, a revelation, if you will, of what is going on in the Trinity, in the triune God. The Son as person never began to exist. Rather, he is eternally begotten as the Son. Now, I know that's very complex, but my point there is to show that it's not as though Christian theologians have never thought of these things at all. And in fact, a lot of Muslim thinkers, and especially those who write a tract like this, have probably given that very little thought. So, 
Please don't think that Christians have never thought about this in our 2,000-plus year history. In fact, this is what the early church fathers were working on answering and talking about and the theology that they were developing based upon what Scripture itself entails with regard to this doctrine of the triune God or the Trinity. Well, on the next page, or the next part, rather, of the pamphlet, they go on to say, rather than being taken literally, we find the term Son of God is symbolically used in the earliest biblical languages for a righteous person and has been used for David, Solomon, and Israel, not exclusively for Jesus. Now, let me go ahead and just say that just because we're talking about Son of God in other uses does not mean that Son of God does not apply, for example, in the instance we just discussed with the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Word, or the eternal Son of God. He is the Son of God in that sense. That obviously doesn't mean that the phrase Son of God appears nowhere else in theology and nowhere else in Scripture. That term is used throughout. They're right about that, and often it is a righteous person, but it doesn't merely mean that at all. In fact, Son of God is used to convey any number of different meanings in Scripture, and the way that we come to understand what that phrase means is by studying our Bibles, by reading it in context and seeing what is being communicated. So they say, for example, Israel is my firstborn son, Exodus 4.22. Well, that's absolutely correct. We see that when we go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now verse 22 that they cite in this pamphlet, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, the imagery here is simply this. We come to this passage through a lens of biblical theology, which is the development of a progressively revealed, redemptive, historical narrative in Scripture. And what we find there is that this language of the son is actually the language of a war between two different offsprings or two different seeds. I'm going to take us to the passage where I get that from in just a moment, but the point here is that Pharaoh had set himself up as this type of God and was trying to rule and reign over the Israelite people. God says, no, Israel's my firstborn son. Let them go or I'm going to kill your firstborn son. There's firstborn son used in an actual literal sense of all of the firstborn children and even actually animals within Egypt there. Now, why does the Lord command this? Well, way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, when Adam and Eve sin against God, God comes and curses the serpent. And he says this to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity or war between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and her offspring or seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now offspring here or seed or children, child, here as offspring or uh, seed is a collective noun. That means that it's a singular noun that can refer to a collect, to a collection of things. It is a collective noun so that when we come to Israel and Egypt, those are collective expressions of the war that's happening between these two seeds here all the way back in Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your head, that is, the seed of the woman will bruise the head. It's a fatal blow of the seed of the serpent, even though the seed of the serpent bruises the heel of the seed of the woman. This is what's known as the Proto-Evangelium. And this is the gospel that is preached beforehand. The gospel preached before the time. Because there's a grace shown to Adam and to Eve. Her name's not yet Eve, by the way. 
There's a grace shown to them in that the serpent here is cursed. There's a grace shown to them in that there is a future because the woman is going to have children. That's why Adam understands this promise and names his wife Eve, calls her Eve, because that name means the mother of all living. Recall that God said, in the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. But they didn't physically die because God showed grace toward them even in their sin, even in their transgressing his command. And so this is the first rattling in scripture, the first indication that there is one coming who's going to crush the head of the serpent, that there's going to be salvation through him, that though his heel is struck, that is, he may even in fact die. And we know that he does, the ultimate singular seed, Jesus, dies on the cross for our sins in our place, the Son of God, the Son of Man, dies on the cross for us, the one God-man who can reconcile God and man, dies on the cross for our sins in our place, and is raised again. He crushes the head of the serpent. The serpent thought he had it won. I mean, how else could he win? He kills the Son of God. And yet through that death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus brings about this great victory. And so, yeah, Son of God is used in lots of different ways in Scripture. Even there in the Exodus account, it is used as part of the fulfillment there in a collective sense in terms of redemptive history uh, to refer to Israel as the firstborn Son of God over against a war with the seed of the serpent, which are the firstborn children of Egypt or Pharaoh. Okay, so Son of God is used in different senses. We can conceive or conceive of that, yes, but we can also concede that point. That says nothing with regard to whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, meaning that he is divine or deity. So that doesn't undermine anything there. They go on to write in the pamphlet, though, in fact, anyone who's righteous is referred to as God's son. Well, not every instance of someone being called righteous uh, also entails that they're called his son, at least explicitly in Scripture. But they are referencing here Romans 8.14. And so I'm going to go over, uh, as you should, to Romans chapter 8 and begin in verse 12 to give some context. I'm not saying that they're pulling this out of context and doing something deceitful with it in every instance or something, but you must always go back to Scripture for the context to understand what's happening to have a better prepared defense for the things you believe. So then, Romans 8, 12, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So if you have the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, living inside of you, you are also a son or a child of God. Now the Spirit there no doubt presents some problems for the Muslim view, which makes it interesting that they are citing or quoting from this verse. But The Spirit of God, then, let's go on, Uh, you have him, you're called sons of God, verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, verse 16 says, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified in him. This is simply a Christian doctrine of adoption as sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the son of God, but we become his brothers and his sisters through faith in him. And so, yes, we're called sons of God, daughters of God in that regard because we have the spirit of God. That's what Romans 8.14 teaches. But this in no wise undermines the unique status that Jesus Christ has as the eternal son of God. Again, once we recognize that son of God is used in different senses in scripture, and that's not creating some sort of contradiction. That's not some sort of cop-out or ad hoc explanation. This is simply what Christians have always believed on the basis of Scripture. Uh, it, it, it's not the case that Jesus, as the divine Son of God, is undermined by this. Going on in the pamphlet, uh, 
they quote from Surah 1935 of the Quran, It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. He is perfect and flawless. When he determines a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. Well, the God of Christianity, first of all, is distinct from Allah, and I, I'm glad that the Muslims are pointing this out in this pamphlet, that we do worship, in fact, distinct gods. Christians believe that we worship the one true God, the triune God of Scripture, who lives, and Muslims worship a false God who is no God at all. But the Muslims want to argue that he's incredibly powerful based on the Quran, that he determines a matter and he says, be, and it is. Well, the God of Christianity says, let there be light, and there is light. The word of God never returns void. It always accomplishes that which God sets it forth to do. But Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is also the word of God. We looked in the last episode on this part one we looked at john 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and then verse two the same was in the beginning with god that is the eternal word of god who is in fact also god we're not talking about distinct beings or entities we're talking about distinct persons in the one being who is god and that word the son of god is powerful and effective and whatnot as well uh, it's not unbefitting God to eternally beget a son in terms of his person in that way. In fact, we should realize that we as finite human beings are completely dependent upon something in God that we cannot fully comprehend. The mystery of the Trinity is in and of itself a proof in that regard for the truth of Christianity. Moreover, how can Allah be perfect and flawless if he cannot do anything, socially speaking, as it were, without a dependence upon his creation to do those things? That is, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit share a glory with one another and share a love with one another from eternity, whereas Allah, who does not consist of a multiplicity of persons, is unable to exercise exercise that altruistic love, a person looking toward another person in and of himself from eternity. That is, Allah is not essentially loving in the way that the triune God of Scripture is. Allah is dependent upon his creation in order to have anyone distinct from himself to love, whereas the God of the Bible is not dependent upon his creation for anything, especially here, love. Well, let's move on. Father and Lord is what the pamphlet addresses next. And they say, in the same way, when the word Father is used to refer to God, it shouldn't be taken literally. Well, I agree in the sense, again, that it's analogical language. This is a way that God has revealed himself to us in human terms, in human language, and in some concepts that we can begin to understand so that we can begin to apprehend, even though we cannot fully comprehend, what and who God is. The Father is the Father in relation to the Son and in relation to the Spirit. We've already talked about that. So in a way, this is insightful here. But Muslims must reduce any term describing God as Father to simply being Father over us. So they go on to say, instead, it's a way of saying God is the creator, the sustainer, and supreme master of all. Well, Christians believe that God, the Father, is a sustainer, and, or rather creator, sustainer, and supreme master of all. We just also believe that from eternity, God the Father is God the Father, and God the Son is God the Son, and the two can never swap places or anything like that. It is also the case, though, that yes, God is the creator, sustainer, and supreme, supreme master of all. Nothing of what's said here undermines in any sense Christian doctrine. They go on to say there are many verses for us to understand this symbolic meaning of the word. Well, that's not a symbolic meaning of the word, Father. For example, and then they quote from Ephesians 4, 6. So let's go to Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
but grace was given to each one of us, verse 7 says, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Well, here again, we have the Spirit. We have the Spirit who's mentioned. We have the Lord who is mentioned. We have God and Father of all who's mentioned. We have Christ who is mentioned. In other words, we have the three persons of the Trinity mentioned on par with one another, equal in authority, essence, being, all of those things, these three distinct persons nonetheless mentioned together here in the text. So this does not go to undermine our understanding of Christian theology, but rather sustains it. Well, moving on in the Father and Lord section of this pamphlet, they write also, Jesus was sometimes called Lord by the disciples. Well, yes, he was. And that can mean a Lord in the terms of sir or master or ruler or a boss, an authority, someone who is a human authority over someone. This term is used in the original languages of the Bible. They continue, for God as well as for people who are held in high esteem. Again, we can concede that without it undermining that Lord may in fact refer to something more here. For example, in the Greek New Testament, the term kyrios is used for both Lord as well as to name the owner of the vineyard in Matthew 20 and verse 8 and the master who beat the disobedient servant in Luke 20 verses 42 through 47. I would go on to read then Matthew chapter 20 and around verse 8. It's a parable that's being told here by Jesus. And he says, And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard called to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, up to the first. And then these come, and they are calling him their boss, their authority, their Lord, this sort of thing. But just as it is with the phrase son of God, meaning different things throughout Scripture and in popular parlance or colloquial speech or whatever else, extra biblical terminology, so also here for the word Lord. It doesn't have to mean deity or divinity every time that it is used. In fact, Sarah called her husband Abraham Lord, it says in scripture. And so we as Christians believe that. That's nothing that undermines our faith. It's interesting, though, that they provide this reference in Luke 20, 42 through 47, because this is not a reference to a master who beats a disobedient servant. Rather, it's this text. I want you to just listen to this closely. And I'm going to leave it here because it's a proof of the divinity of Jesus that Jesus himself offers. So I imagine what they were doing is they were going to try to address this problem for their view from the word of God, but instead they wound up just leaving it in the parentheses for a different text that they meant to cite. So in Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 21, but he said to them, how can they say that the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord. So David's Lord said to his his Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus asked this question then based on that Psalm. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he? His son, that is, how is he David's son? So there's a Lord who has a Lord, and it's David's Lord who has the Lord, and yet the Lord is David's son. Well, we're told elsewhere in Scripture that he is the root and the descendant of Jesse. So in other words, divinely speaking, in terms of creation itself and the essence of the son as God, David is because God was. David is because God always was. God the Son created everything such that King David could even become a son in the first place. But it's also the case that in terms of humanity, when the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, takes on a human flesh to himself, he is then, he becomes the Son of David, the prophesied one, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the Christ who came to save his people from their sins by giving his life, by dying on the cross for our sins in our place and being raised again so that everyone who turns for their, from their sins and trusts in Jesus Christ will not perish but have everlasting life. There's forgiveness of sins, justice is served, and yet he's the justifier of those who f- have faith in Jesus. We're forgiven of our sins, we're cr- granted a righteous standing, 
in God's sight. None of that undermines Christian doctrine. If anything, it confirms Christian doctrine. But the unique thing about that word kyrios or Lord is that in the, roughly speaking, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, what's called the Septuagint, now there's a lot we could talk about with that, but roughly speaking, the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, when it comes across terms like Yahweh or when it comes across terms like Adonai, it translates those, the names of God, it translates them as Lord. And so when the apostles ascribe this name, this title, to Jesus. Indeed, when the disciples call Jesus Lord, it's not merely that they're calling him Lord in a human sense, as we can find in other instances, even in scripture, those examples of mere humans, but they are ascribing to Jesus the title, the name of God. They understand that Jesus is Yahweh of the Old Testament, that he is the Son of God. For example, we talked last time on this in part one, I believe, about John chapter 12 and how uh, he sees Jesus and he talks about Jesus and he says that Isaiah saw his glory. That is when Isaiah saw the son seated on the throne in Isaiah 6, that was in fact the son. When he saw Yahweh seated there on the throne, that was the son of God who then took on human flesh later in human history and we know him now as Jesus. Well, going on with Father and Lord, in other parts of the Bible, Jesus is even called a servant of God by the disciples. We've already touched on this. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. They quote from Acts 3.13, and they claim this clearly shows that when Lord is used to refer to Jesus, it's a title of respect, not divinity. Well, no, it does not clearly show that for all of the reasons that I just mentioned. But I want to read that verse there in Acts chapter 3, verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But listen to this next verse in 14. But you denied, so they, they denied who? They, they delivered over and denied Jesus the servant of God, okay? But you denied, verse 14 says, the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's Barabbas. Verse 15, and you killed the author of life, that's Jesus still, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Verse 16, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man his perfect health in the presence of you all. And this is the, the healing here um, of the lame beggar. Well, this, again, does not undermine or undercut Christian theology and doctrine concerning the person of Christ Jesus as God and man at all but rather confirms it, especially that passage in Acts that they quote from here. So yes, Jesus can be the servant. He's called the servant throughout scripture. Christians don't deny that. We actually believe he's the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53, the one who was prophesied long before he ever even came to earth. That's the point of Christian theology. Jesus gave his life for us and was raised again victoriously over the grave. He is the Son of God, and thus he's able to secure our salvation from sins. By the way, I'll turn that a little bit on any of the Muslims watching. How can Allah be the most gracious, most merciful, most compassionate one? How can he be that and be just, be righteous as well? If we are to be judged according to our works, how is it that Allah can also have mercy or compassion on us if he's just? The Christian God can do this because God punishes the sins of his people. He brings about justice through the death of his son, Jesus, who carries those sins upon himself on the cruel cross, the scandalous cross. He justifies us through that sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
God is both just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is both a God of wrath and justice, but he's also a God of grace and mercy. And he's able to do all of this as demonstrated in the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus pays for our sins pays for the penalty of our sins to give us new life, to give us forgiveness of sins without himself being unjust and without himself being just to the preclusion of our forgiveness. You don't have that in Islam, so I don't know what you're going to do with that. I would encourage you, though, I would plead with you then to come to Christ Jesus who can save you. Allah cannot. This pamphlet goes on in Judaism. Jesus, and they write, peace be upon him, is denied as the Messiah. Well, yes, in Judaism, Jesus is denied as the Messiah. This, again, is in the New Testament. This is in stark contrast to Christianity, where he is worshipped as a deity or the Son of God. Yes, and deity and Son of God are interchangeable there. Wonderful. Thank you for clarifying that Islam and Judaism and Christianity worship three different gods. Islam, it goes on to say, takes the middle ground. Well, no, it doesn't, and that doesn't really mean much anyway, and acknowledges Jesus as an honorable prophet and messenger of God. Well, how can Jesus be an honorable prophet and messenger of God if he lies about his identity, claiming to be equal with God, as Jesus, in fact, did in the gospel accounts? Anyway, moving on, he, uh, they claim that he's an honorable prophet and messenger of God, as well as the Messiah, but... Muslims do not worship him, as worship is for God alone, who created Jesus and everything that exists. Well, again, the Son of God is not created. In Islam, it's interesting that they could maybe call him a son. They could call Jesus a son in the sense of him being created, and yet they want to stay away from that language. Again, it just goes to show some of the confusion that results when we conflate Christianity and Islam. Now, I can't remember if I said this in part one of this series or not, but Muslims actually do affirm select portions of Scripture. They believe that it's a revelation of God, but they believe that it's also been corrupted. And so that's the reason for what you've heard throughout this particular episode, the picking and the choosing, kind of the the buffet approach to we're going to use this saying here from the word of God or from uh, the gospel accounts or from the mouth of Jesus, but we're going to reject the rest of this or we're going to pull this from context and that sort of thing. What's happening is an argument is being built and that is very much in accord with the nature of the Quran in which there's a Jesus described, an Isa, but that Jesus is not in any wise the Jesus of the gospel accounts. And in fact, to quote uh, James R. White, uh, Dr. White mentions that the Jesus of the Quran is an argument, not a person. I think that's exactly right. When you read the Quran through, uh, you are reading of an argument. Oh, he's not the son of God. He's not God. That sort of thing. Not historical accounts and records of what Jesus, the man, did on earth, who was not merely man, but also God. One person, two natures, the man, Jesus Christ, is the mediator between God and and men. Well, they believe that God created Jesus, created the Son of God, uh, Jesus. They wouldn't say that he created the Son of God. They believe that he created Jesus. Jesus is a mere man. He's a Messiah. He's a messenger, a prophet, even perhaps that he does some divine things, but they would not attribute to him a divine status, deity, in the way that Christians do, because we accept the Bible and the Bible alone as the word of God. And it teaches very clearly that Jesus is God come in the flesh. Nothing that we've seen in the pamphlet today overturns any of that. The last thing I want to address from their pamphlet in this episode is Surah 1930 that they quote in the Quran. Jesus said, according to their Quran, Jesus said, indeed, I am the slave of Allah or God. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. Here again, this is simply an argument It's not an actual historical account. The Quran came much later, and there are textual difficulties even when it comes to the Quran because under Uthman, everything was uh, deleted, destroyed. The Qurans were put to the fire that did not match the one that was selected out, 
And so what we have today, we don't even know if it is a very, well, we know it's not verifiable, but we don't know if it's an accurate representation of what Muhammad and the others there would have put together initially anyway, because we only have that one copy, that one record uh, that persists through time, uh, and then itself is later on uh, subject to some textual critical difficulties. In any event, Come to the Jesus who's given in Scripture. If you are a Muslim watching this, I encourage you, read the Gospel accounts. Turn to the Christian Bible, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read there the Jesus presented in the Word of God, and see if the Spirit of God doesn't move you to understand things about him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to God the Father but by him. Go and do that and see if you don't see that there in the pages of his book. And I'm going to pray for you that you do come to life in Christ Jesus through interacting with reading these gospel accounts in the Christian Bible, rather than these mere arguments that are presented that are misrepresentations of the Christian God and of Jesus Christ himself in the Quran and also in in this pamphlet here. Thank you for watching today. Uh, if you know someone who needs to hear this, go ahead now and share this episode with them. Share one of the other episodes. Share future episodes with them. Send it their way. Make sure also to share this episode across your social media platforms. Go ahead and click like. Subscribe to our channel. If you would, we would really appreciate that. Uh, this has been Christ or Chaos once again with Chris Bolt. <laughs>